Hello, my name's Harold Wilderson. I'm really happy to be here today, and uh, I'm happy because a lot of good things are happening. Now, if you're not a Christian and you don't, you don't, uh, you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior. Right now is a good time to do it because we don't know when our time here is up, when we're going to graduate and move on up higher, and so get yourself right with Jesus, accept Him into your heart. That's the first thing I want you to know. And I'm happy because good things are happening. And, uh, but you can also be joyful when bad things are happening. You can be joyful all the time. You can have the joy of the Lord. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. Against such there is no law. And just stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free or made us free and be not entangled again into the yoke of bondage. Today we're going to talk about uh, the title of what I want to talk about. We are going to talk about here today uh, is Tell the Stories. Yeah, tell the stories. I've been, I don't know if it's accused or I've been told that I'm a storyteller. I love a good story. I love to hear a good story. And uh, I think I'm going to start off, I wasn't planning on doing this, but it just now came to me. I think one of the first things I want to share with you is a story out of the Bible. Um, and when I say tell the stories, uh, I'm talking about testimonies. All through the Bible, we have testimonies of what God has done for his people in the when they were crossing the red the uh, the, the desert uh, for 40 years um, every now and then they'd get themselves in big trouble and they'd just cry out to God they'd they cry out to God and the Bible says and God heard their cry and I've cried out to God so many times in my life and sometimes I just whisper out to God I just it's a, just a I'm so weak and down, and uh, when, I, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's what St. Paul said, and it's, it's nice to know that we have strength even in our weakness. But anyhow, uh, I remember crying out to God one day, and uh, we talk a lot, the Lord and me, and uh, I was there working what we call the Fadville Farm, and I was working on the uh, shuttle feeder, and it was acting up, it was jumping off the track, and so finally I got so frustrated, I just climbed up in the feed bunk and got up to that shuttle feeder and it was coming up towards me and it had jumped off the track and it was bouncing along. And I had a crowbar in my hand about three feet long and I stuck that thing in there and I went to pry that wheel up. I usually do it with the thing shut down, but when you shut it down, you got to shut off the silo loader, you got to shut off the conveyor, you got to shut off the shuttle feeder, shut all that stuff down and then climb up in the feed bunk. And the cattle were all there pushing and shoving, wanting to get to the first bite of feed that drops out of that feeder. And so I was frustrated that day in a hurry. I, nobody else was around. It was just me there. And so it was a dumb thing to do, but I jumped up in there and took that crowbar while it was moving and slammed that end of that crowbar in there and pried up on it real quick to get it back up on the track. And in so doing, that thing grabbed a hold of my hand and just my hand was in there tight and it I was burning the belt on the shuttle feeder. That's how tight I was. It was actually burning the belt. It was smoking. And I was tight. And my first reaction was to cry out to God. Now, I didn't say, oh, Lord God, this is a beautiful day. You've blessed us with all these things and blah, blah, blah. How we usually do. Not blah, blah, blah. I shouldn't have said blah, blah, blah. It's a wonderful thing to recognize God and who he is and what he's done for you. That's, that's all wonderful. But in a case where you're really in big trouble, you don't have time for that. As you've said that to him many times before, but right now it's time to cry out to God. And I'm going to do, I'm, I know, I remember the exact three words that I said at that moment. I didn't have time for any preliminaries. I just said these words and I'm going to turn my face away from the mic and I'm going to say what I said, the same tone of voice. I was tight and I cried out to God, and these are the words, help me, God, just like that. That's what I said. I hope I didn't blow the speakers or anything, but that's, that's how I said it. That's what I said, and instantly, there was no waiting around. In the, when God heard the Israelites crying out to him, they would cry out, and, and he immediately would answer their prayer. And so he answered my prayer right away, and, and I instantly got the message, give your hand a jerk as hard as you can. And I gave my hand a jerk, and my hand came out of there. It, it was a miracle because I was tight, really tight, burning the belts. I pulled my hand out and my glove stayed in there. I had a glove on. Hallelujah for gloves. I love to wear gloves, and especially this time of year in the wintertime. Anyhow, uh, I gave my hand to jerk and there were three big, three big grooves, uh, not three, four grooves right across the back of my fingers. If, it, if I hadn't had gloves on, it would probably torn my fingers up, at least ripped the skin off of them. 
uh, probably probably taking the skin clear down to my nail when I gave a jerk because I I was strong at that time, a lot stronger I am now, and I gave that thing a jerk and came out of there. But God, the point is, God heard my prayer when I cried out to him. He heard my prayer, and he instantly put in my head in a split second to jerk as hard as you can. And so that's just one little incident. It's a story. It's a story I love to tell because God heard my prayer and he answered my prayer instantly. And that's what I like. I like instant answers to prayer. Sometimes I don't get an instant answer to prayer. But another story that I love out of the Bible uh, was where um, <clears throat> this dear lady uh, had an issue of blood, the Bible says. I think uh, she was bleeding. It was her time of month. Uh, and but the trouble was her time a month was going on day after day after day week after week she was actually uh this isn't in the bible i never read it in there but in my i like to read between the lines okay when you read the bible there's things that aren't told uh and when when you're uh, uh sing a song sometimes uh there's stuff in between the lines that you need to know Gloria Gaither, Bill Gaither's wife, was talking about that one day, and she said, you need to read between the lines in some of these beautiful songs we hear. And so I'm reading between the lines. I think she was actually bleeding to death. I think, I think death was coming. She had spent all of her money, the Bible says, on doctors, and nothing they did helped. She kept on bleeding, and she was dying. Uh, you don't keep on bleeding and not die eventually, because your blood as soon, as soon will be gone. And so anyhow, uh, she heard she heard the word of the Lord. It was the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord was Jesus, is, Jesus is coming to town. And she had already heard about Jesus and the many miracles that he had been performing, raising the dead, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers and casting out demons. She heard all that. And she knew it was true because she probably knew people that had been cleansed of leprosy. Uh, who had been raised from the dead. She probably, I don't know if this was before or after Lazarus, uh, being raised from the dead, but she knew that these things were true and that he was coming to town. So she was getting herself prepared and she was telling everybody she, you know, when you're excited about something, you don't want to just keep it to yourself. You want to tell your best friends first, you tell your best friends and then wherever you're going, if you're excited about something, you want to tell people. And so, um, I picture her in the market, you know, getting some groceries. Uh, maybe she's picking out oranges or bananas or whatever. And there's a lady walks up to get her, produce and and she told the lady did you hear jesus is coming to town and she, and she said and i know that if i can just get near to him she said there's going to be big crowds the crowd's going to be big pushing and shoving trying to get to jesus and she said but you know what if i can just get to the hem of his garment and touch it i'll be made whole she said you need to come jesus is coming to town she was so excited so the big day arrives uh, oh wait a minute before we get to the big day <laughs> She kept saying this. She kept repeating uh, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord was Jesus is coming to town. And uh, so she kept repeating it. She said it over and over again. Just touch the hem of his garment. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. I'm going to be made whole. And that's how we build our faith. We take the word of God and we start repeating it. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so you, you find out what the word of God is. You say it. And you say it again and you say it again. You keep saying it until you get it into your head. And then there's no doubt after a while you're, you have, you believe what you're hearing. And then this belief, this faith that you have in what you're hearing drops out of your head and drops right down into your heart or into your spirit. And that's when true faith, that's when faith actually becomes perfect faith. Faith is a grain of mustard seed. Just that little teensy tiny bit will move mountains. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Um, if you shall say unto this mountain, I just crossed the mountain a while ago coming over here. And he said, have faith in God. If you shall, if you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. That makes me think, I better watch what I say if I'm going to have whatever I say. I don't want to say that I'm sick. I don't want to say that I got anything. I know a dear brother, an old farmer. He's written a number of books. One of my favorite author, authors, Charles Capps. When he gets up in the morning, he feels a little bit sniffly, sniffly, uh, 
like he's getting a cold. He won't admit it. He'll he'll tell his wife, I think I'm taking on a, a healing. Yeah, I think I'm taking on a healing. He won't admit because that's what the devil wants you to say. He wants you to say that you're getting a cold, that you're getting cancer, that you're getting arthritis, whatever it is. He wants you to say it because he knows that we shall have whatsoever we say right from the word of God. Jesus, the words of Jesus. And so Jesus goes on to say, therefore, whatever what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And uh, on uh, back in Psalm 37, he, uh, the Lord says, uh, delight thyself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. If you're hurting today, you have a relationship with your spouse or a friend that's going bad and, and you're really hurting and your desire is for, to have that relationship fixed, Delight yourself in the Lord. Well, this dear lady who had the issue of blood, she delighted herself in the Lord. She was so excited about Jesus coming to town. And she was saying it over and over. Every day she was saying, oh, I'm so excited. When I, if I can get through that crowd and get to Jesus, and she said, and touch the hem of his garment. Well, why would she touch the hem of his garment? Why wouldn't she just walk up to him and touch him and be healed? No, I think she knew that she was a woman. She was an outcast. And there, everybody's opinion, she was... Uh, dirty, uh, unclean. They would yell out unclean. If they knew you were having that kind of problem and they saw you in a crowd, they would yell out unclean. And so she knew that as a woman, she was also weaker than most of the men that were going to be trying to get to Jesus. And she already, I think she envisioned in her mind when she'd get so close and the crowd was pushing and shoving, trying to get to Jesus, that she might have to get down on the ground and crawl through those big, husky guy's legs or whatever she had to do to get, to get in to Jesus. And if she's going to be down there in the ground and she just reaches up and touches the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. That's what she said. And she said it over and over again. It finally, this belief in Jesus dropped from her head down into her heart. And by the time she crawled through those legs and pushed her way, shoving, probably men were losing her balance and falling into each other. She finally got the hem of Jesus' garment and she touched his garment and she was made whole instantly. Jesus wheeled around. <laughs> I can just see it now. He wheeled around and said, who touched me? Now here he is, he's being pushed and shoved, being jostled around and all of a sudden he yells out, who touched me? <laughs> the disciples said, are you crazy? They, they didn't probably say that, but they, that's what they were thinking probably. Are you crazy? These people are pushing and shoving and you say, who touched me? Are you crazy? No. Jesus said, I felt healing. I felt virtue go out of me. Somebody touched me. And about that time, this dear lady heard him and she said, it was, it was me, Lord. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Her faith came from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. She heard the word of God and she kept hearing it and hearing it, and hearing it, until it was so deep in her heart that when she touched Jesus, the hem of his garment, she was made whole. Faith, a lot of times, comes from a story, from a testimony. Do you know, can you imagine the testimonies that were flying around over that area? Jesus was there going from town to town, the testimonies were flying around. Somebody walks up and they said, Jesus touched me. I got a new leg. Uh, Jesus touched me. Leprosy's gone. Look at my skin, pure skin. Testimonies were flying around. And that's what builds faith. Another friend of mine, Bill Johnson, uh, said he was talking to some man somewhere. I, I have the story right here. I brought the book along. Uh, and this man said that uh, he had, I think he had an operation on his shoulder and there was a great big knot on his shoulder that was very painful. And it just wouldn't go away. It didn't matter what the doctors would do. And Bill said, well, I've seen that kind of a thing. I've seen that kind of thing healed many times. I think he said maybe hundreds of times he's seen, because he's, he's into healing, pe healing people in the name of Jesus be healed. And so when his wife heard that, she grabbed her husband's hand and slapped it up on his shoulder on that big old knot on his shoulder. And she said, be healed in the name of Jesus. And he was instantly healed. Now, Bill was just telling him that I've seen that happen. I've seen things like that be healed instantly. 
And that was a testimony. And the testimony produced faith uh, in this wife's mind, at least. And she laid hands on her husband with no doubt in her mind. Well, if, he, if Jesus does this for hundreds of other people, he'll do it for my husband. She said, be healed in Jesus' name. The testimony, the testimony. Tell the stories, tell the stories. And that's what was going on. This dear lady was hearing the stories, testimonies. I want to do a little analogy. Uh, I grew up a farmer. I'm still a farmer, still live there on the, on the farm. And uh, all my life I've planted and cultivated and harvested all my life. I'm still doing it, even though I don't make my living farming. Uh, we have the whole farm in hay and we just make hay and it's fun. It gives me a little chance to farm a little bit. There's some of that in my system. I think once you're a farmer, you're always a farmer at heart. You're planting seeds. And I thought about this past summer, we had a lot of beautiful zinnias that we planted and in our flower beds and they were red and they were yellow and orange and all different kinds of beautiful flowers. It was the most beautiful flower beds we've ever had since we've lived there for the last 35 years. And I got to thinking and somewhere I read something that sparked this thought. You take a, a zinnia, for instance, a flower. I'm going to just say a zinnia and you have it in a pot. These weren't in the pots. These were, these were all through our flower beds. And you, you watch that plant grow and you know it's going to bloom sometime. It's going to be beautiful. And so in the fall, they kind of dry up. The flowers that are on there kind of dry up, wither and dry. And you take some of those seeds and you put one of those seeds at some point in a pot, in another pot. And it starts to grow. And in your mind, you have no doubt at all that there's going to be another flower coming on. Because that's what seeds do. You plant seeds and you get a plant just like the miracle before. The, the plant that came out of a seed before that you have in your flower beds, those plants are all miracles. Who else can take a little teensy tiny seed and make it turn into something so beautiful? Only God can do that. And so it reminds me of a little thought I've had many times. I share it many times. I've probably shared it here before. But it's, it's so worth sharing. You know, any one of us, I don't care who you are, you can cut an apple open and you can take the, all the seeds out of that apple. There might be eight or ten of them in there. And you can count the seeds in an apple. We, any one of us can do that. If, you're, if you've been to, to first grade, you can probably count the seeds in an apple. But guess what? Only God can count the apples in a seed, in an apple seed. You imagine everything is exponential. God created us for exponential growth. He created us and he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. I don't think he was only talking about having lots of babies and having exponential growth. I think he really wanted the Garden of Eden to spread all over the whole earth. And it just the earth would be one great big Garden of Eden. Eden, Eden would just grow. Our little town of Chambersburg, when I was a boy, I remember driving through different parts of our town, now the fastest growing parts of our town, and they were cornfields. Now it's big commercial buildings and housing, and it, towns seem to grow. If you're doing something right, people want to be there. They want to live there. They want to build their house there. They want to have their business there, and so it grows. And uh, so God created us for exponential growth. And I want you to receive Christ as your Savior. And I want all your aunties and uncles and cousins through your life, through your words, through your testimonies, through the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, Revelation says, overcome the enemy and let's see some exponential growth in the kingdom of God through all this. We can do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Nothing is impossible with God. And I, I love some of these words uh, in the Bible that I just passed over most of my life. The word nothing. The word all. Some of them are just little three-letter words. The word but. Uh, Satan comes to steal and to kill and destroy. This is one place there isn't a but. I want to share some others that have a but. There isn't a but there. Some translations have a semicolon. Uh, some just have a period. 
And then it starts a new sentence. Jesus is saying these words, the thief comes, that's the devil, that's Satan, comes to steal and to kill and destroy. He doesn't want you alive. He wants you dead. He wants to steal your victory. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to just tear you up and spit you out in little pieces. But the next sentence says these words, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. These are the words of Jesus. And this sentence these two sentences, there's no but. If there's a but there, it means don't worry about that part that I just got done saying. Here's what's really important. But I have come. No, Jesus did not put a but in there. He just stopped his sentence and went on with the next one. In my understanding, when he put a period there, it meant, look, this is very important for you to know, dear Christian, dear dear brother, dear sister, whoever you are. This is important to know that Satan wants to come and destroy you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy, period. Here's another thing that's uh, important too and more important than what we just said, but you need to know what I just said. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. An abundant life is what Jesus wants for us. If you're a daddy or you're a mother, I always call my dad daddy and my mother was mother. She told us at a very early age, we're not calling her mom, we're not calling her mommy. She's mother. And my daddy was daddy, not dad, not father, not anything, but daddy. That's what she, and, and she didn't like what she had to call her parents as a girl growing up. It was mom and pop from Lebanon County. They were Pennsylvania Dutch and it was mom and pop. She didn't want to be called mom and she didn't want her husband to be called pop. He wanted to be called daddy. So we, I, he's still daddy to me. He's, a, he's. He already graduated, so did my mom. They're up there just having a ball. We never believed in dancing, but I, I have a feeling they're up there dancing a, on those golden streets, having a big time, mother and daddy. And so here's this lady with the issue of blood. She's healed. She's excited, and it, but it, and it was her faith. He said, daughter, thy faith has made you whole. And that faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You take the word of God, and uh, you just repeat it over and over again. I don't. I can't tell you how many times I've quoted out of uh, Isaiah chapter fifty-three. And by his stripes ye were healed. I can't wait to meet this guy. I'm going to tell you about. And I've told this story before, and I love the story. And I'm looking forward to when I get to heaven and I can find that guy. He's not going to be lost. He's going to be there. And if, I think I'll probably just think I want to talk to this guy. I don't even know his name. A little black brother, the preacher, he's a pastor. And he was preaching Easter, Sunday morning. And he was telling the people about Jesus and how that he was crucified. Before they nailed him, before they nailed him to the cross, they tied him to a whipping post and started lashing him with a cat of nine tails. If you don't know what a cat of nine tails is, from what I understand, it was nine strips of leather, little narrow strips of leather, probably like shoelaces or something heavier, leather. And on the end of each one of those strips of leather there was something sharp a sharp object a, a sharp stone a piece of bone a jagged piece of bone uh maybe a piece of glass i don't know if they had glass back there but some uh scholars bible scholars think they did and is anything sharp metal maybe some kind of metal that was sharp <clears throat> and when they struck the back of the person they were going to uh give this lashing to they didn't just hit him in the back with this thing when they hit their arm was they had their arm up high and they hit and they were bringing their arm down at the same time as that thing hit it went down across their back and ripped their back to shreds and i think jesus this doesn't it doesn't say this in the bible but i think this is what happened they hit him bleeding they plucked out his beard they were ripping his back to shreds i think he was standing there in a pool of blood and he was shedding that blood he was taking those stripes for our healing the bible says so it says, and by his stripes ye were healed. Well, this dear little black brother, I love him so much. I can't wait to meet him. I have a lot of black friends, and I love them dearly. Uh, quite a few of them are starting to come to our church, and we're just happy to have them there. But he said that Sunday morning, uh, he was explaining this nasty lashing, these uh, stripes on Jesus' back. They would just they had his back ripped to shreds. They were cursing him. They were spitting on him. They were just doing every everything they could that was evil there was no mercy they just and then they they were plucking out his beard tearing his beard out and cursing him and spitting and just being as mean as they could be they say crucifixion is the worst death you can ever could ever experience 
Most people would sooner just be shot, but they didn't give him that kind of mercy. They, they tortured him. But he said these words, <laughs> and I have to laugh, and it just makes me love this guy so much because what he said, a little five-year-old could understand. The gospel is easy to understand. You do give your heart to Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so he said these words. He said, now, and by his stripes ye were healed. Uh, I grew up on King James Version and it said, you were healed. And he said, now, if you were healed, that means it's already done. So if you were healed, then that means you are healed. And he said, if you are healed, then it is only my dear black brother could say it and many other of my black friends would say it, then you is healed. If you are healed, then you is healed. <laughs> and it, it just tickled me because it's so true. The truth is, the truth will make you free. And uh, I think a lot of people got, he got freedom that morning. If they weren't a Christian, by the time he was done preaching the word, I think a lot of them gave their hearts to Jesus. And so we're going to talk about telling the stories. And um, I have about 15 minutes now. That was, that was my introduction. <laughs> and, and we're going to talk about telling the stories. And I want to go back to um, Deuteronomy and chapter 28. There's 68 verses. I was going to read them all, but I don't have time. And the first 14 verses, God was telling the Israelites um, that if you listen to me, if you obey my voice, here's what's going to happen to you. Here it is. Chapter 28, Deuteronomy, read the whole chapter sometime. I'll give you little bits and pieces, but the first 14 verses I'm going to read. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord our God to observe carefully all, there's that little word all, all his commandments, which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. How would you like to be overtaken in blessings? I mean, He'll pour you out a blessing you won't even have room to receive. And I got more stories about that, but I don't know how time. Overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Now, here's what I like to call the benefits package. You go to work and your boss has a benefits package for you. You get so many weeks of vacation. You get so many days off sick pay. You get uh, bonuses at Christmas and all the different things they give you in your benefits package. Here's the benefits package, and I've never heard one this good before from any boss or any employer. Verse three, benefits package. I have that written right above these verses. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be, shall you be in the country. That means if you live in the city, you're blessed. If you live in the country, you're blessed. If you live in the country and you go to the city, you're still blessed. If you live in the city and go in the country, you're blessed some more. Um, and blessed shall be the fruit of your body. That would be your offspring, your babies, your children. The, the produce of your ground, that was for the farmers. They worked hard to make a, a crop of wheat or corn or whatever back then. Now we get in our five hundred, six, seven hundred thousand dollar $700,000 combine, and we take 30 feet out across the field all at one time, and all the grain comes out into a big bin, and uh, we chop our salads with a four-inch harvester that takes 12 rows at a time and spits it out in little tiny pieces into a big semi or a 10-wheeler truck or a um, 16-wheeler triaxle truck, whatever, and it's all happened so fast. They worked hard back then. But your, the produce of your ground and the increase of your herds the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. I, I remember what I, I do some real estate. I was selling this farm, this dear Mennonite brother of mine. Uh, we were sitting there in his kitchen, writing up an offer on this farm. And his wife was off to the side at the kitchen counter. And she was just, she was, you could see she was doing something with her hands and she was really into it. What she was doing, she was kneading her bread. And I said something about it to my brother and he said, Oh, yes, and she makes me fresh bread every day. He was so blessed by that. And I thought of that when I read this. Blessed shall be your basket. That'd be all your stuff you gathered up at the, at the market or whatever it was, and your kneading bowl or whatever you gathered out of your garden, your kneading bowl. Kneading bowl uh, was where you worked your bread and you kneaded it with your hands. Blessed shall you be when you come in. And blessed shall you be when you go out. It doesn't matter what you're doing. When I, when I came in here, I was blessed. And when I, when I leave after a while, I'm going to be blessed. I'm blessed when I come in. I'm blessed when I go out. How much better does it get than that? 
You don't get that kind of blessing where you work probably, but you might, depending on who your boss is. Uh, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated. Before your face. They shall come against you one way and flee from you, flee before you seven, seven ways. They'll come in, they're coming against you. And next thing you know, they're just fleeing seven different directions. They're just running as hard as they can because they're scared. Verse eight says, the Lord will command the blessing on you. How would you like the Lord to command a blessing on you? It's no, it's no uh, well, maybe anything like this. It. It's a command from the Lord to be, that you'll be blessed in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And I have four exclamation marks, regular size, and then I have one big exclamation mark. And I, if, if you ever pick up a book that I'm reading, you'll see that a lot through the book. I'll, see, I'll read something that's really good. And I'll do these five exclamation marks. They mean, I love God you lord that's the fourth four and then that great big one jesus i love you lord jesus and i and so the lord will establish you as a holy people to himself just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the lord your god and walk in his ways then all there's the word all again all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the lord and they shall be afraid of you we have a lot of people that don't like jews they want to kill them and there's a lot of nasty stuff happening to Jews right now. But they'll see you, that you are called by the name of the Lord and shall, they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, that would be your offspring, in the increase of your livestock and the produce of your ground and in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, his good storehouse, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not bother. But, I'm sorry. You shall, you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You'll have plenty. You don't have to go borrowing money to buy a house. You won't have to borrow. That's how good the Lord's going to bless you. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath. If you heed or listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them. When I see that word heed, it reminds me of when I was a boy. I was old enough to sit in the back seat with the other boys, maybe 13, 14. And we had a dear brother. His name was Frank. We had ministering brethren. We didn't have pastors. There was like four or five ministering brethren. They took turns preaching. Nobody got paid to do it. They just did it. And, uh, and I can remember Brother Frank, if one of the other pastors or ministering brethren were preaching and when they got finished he would stand up to close the service and he'd say a brother has brought us many interesting he didn't say interesting he, he i'm just we would sit in the back seat and say the words ahead of him because we knew exactly what he was gonna say our brother has brought us many interesting uh, thoughts this morning and uh, and then he'd finish up with let us take heed to the message of the morning that's what he said. We were saying it right ahead of him. Let us take heed. <laughs> and it was a, it's a good memory because we knew what was on his heart and what he wanted to say and he would say it. And so, and the Lord commanded us to take heed uh, to the message that he's, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and, careful and, be, and are careful to observe them, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left, or go after other gods to serve them. And I got a wow there and four exclamation marks and a big exclamation mark. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, that's the first 14 verses. There's 68 verses in this chapter. And um, the rest of the verses, after verse 14, they're all curses. These curses. And it's like another couple pages in the Bible of curses that are going to come upon you. And a lot of them are just opposite from what he said in the blessings. Uh, and not just, uh, it wasn't just, uh, if you don't obey the voice of the Lord to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Not just some, but all of these curses. Every one of them. And then he goes on to talk about all the curses, all the stuff that's going to happen to you. Uh, your, your fruit of your body won't be blessed. You'll have babies that are 
uh, cursed. They'll, they'll be sick. They'll be born. Maybe live a couple of days and die. And, and your flocks do the same thing. They'll be cursed when you come in, cursed when you go out. And uh, I just want to catch a couple of things down here. Uh, you'll have all kinds of diseases and all this stuff. And your carcasses, uh, though, your enemies will come out against you. Uh, you'll come out against them and flee seven ways before them. You shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. We see this uh, in our world today. Your carcasses shall be fed for all the birds of the air and the kingdoms of the earth. I can just see the vultures, the we, turkey buzzards we have. Every now and then one will come up and land on the peak of our barn roof and just sit there like he, he he's waiting to have breakfast and he's just getting ready. And on back, I just underlined a couple of things. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to other people and your eyes shall look and fall and fail with longing for them all day long. And there shall be no strength in your hands. You'll be driven mad because of the sight which your eyes see. Um, locusts shall consume all your trees and, produce, and, and the produce of your land. Uh, you shall, he shall lend to you, you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head and you shall be the tail. If you don't listen to the voice of the Lord your God, here's some more things that are going to happen. You'll be in need of everything. You'll put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. And it'll talk about nations coming against you. And here it is. I want to mention this. This is really nasty stuff that's going to happen to you if you don't hearken to the Lord your God. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters whom the Lord has given you in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. And a man will be sensitive. The sensitive and the very refined man will, among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and, the, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat because not, he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits, and your enemy shall distress you at all gates, at all your gates. The tender and delicate woman, or the sensitive and refined woman among you, who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity, will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and to her daughter the placenta, the afterbirth, which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears for she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. This is just a little sampling of what's going to happen if you don't obey the voice of the Lord. And you should get Deuteronomy 28 out and read it. I, this, I think this was uh, King James, New King James maybe. The part I don't like about King James and I grew up with it and I love it is that they don't capitalize the words he when they're talking about God and him. All the pronouns are just small letters and I think that's disrespectful because <laughs> I, I learned better in grade school that you don't do that. Um, so in the end the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again and there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves but no one will buy you. That's what's coming if you don't hearken it to the Lord your God. Now all those curses, all those blessings, I'd like to finish up with, let me find my, get the right page here. It fell on the floor. <laughs> the ledge isn't as high as it needs to be for me. I had it when I came in here. Save the best for last. This is a good part. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 3. And, O oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. 
Did you not receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Have having begun in the spirit, you, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, or just, that, that's the end of that sentence. And then we'll start a new sentence, verse seven. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham with beforehand saying, if you, if you, I'm sorry, it's not if, in you, all the names, all the nations shall be blessed. And so then those who are of faith and blessing with believing so then those who are of faith are, bl- are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all these things which are written in the book of the law to do them. We just, we were reading all this, all this curse, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ was redeemed. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. All those curses, all those verses, clear up to verse 668 in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Christ has redeemed us from all the curses of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's where that comes from. He took all those curses for us. And I got a minute yet, but I only need a minute to finish this. Uh, On down, it it, it just basically, Galatians chapter, you need to read it for yourself. We don't have time to read the whole chapter. But uh, for you, verse 26, are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ you put on Christ. There is neither new Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's beautiful. All this trash that's going to happen if you don't obey the voice of the Lord your God back in Bible times when they were crossing it. And the, the, the Israelites were just in a big mess. He told them. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Obey my commandments. And these, all these blessings we talked about will come upon you. But if you don't, here's all these curses, 10 times more curses than there are blessings, you know, just pages of curses. But if you receive Jesus as your savior, you don't have to bear all those curses. You can receive all the blessings that are in your um, benefits package as a newborn Christian. And the benefits package now is so much greater than what it was back in Bible times, back in the children of Israel's time. You can have all these benefits as you receive Jesus, your savior. So do it now. Don't wait around. It's not, you don't have to be very smart to know uh, that you don't want to go to hell. I didn't want to go to hell as a little boy. And so I wanted to receive Jesus for no other reason, just not to go to hell. I didn't know about all the benefits yet at that point in my life. But they were coming, and I received Jesus. That was the best day of my life. I remember coming up out of the water. It was the middle of December in the falling spring stream uh, in Chambersburg. Middle of December. It was cold. They took, you, took us down into the water, each one of us that were getting baptized. And they dipped us three times forward in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. I come up out of that water, shaking all over more than anywhere else. I mean, I was just shaking. And I come you couldn't even hardly talk. You were so cold. And I remember coming up out of the water, felt like a thousand tons of weight was taken off my body. And I was saved and I was baptized. And I wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost yet completely. I was had the Holy Ghost, but he didn't have me exactly yet. And so anyhow, I come up out of there and there was a couple of deacons' wives there with towels and blankets and they wrapped me in the middle of December. It was cold. And uh, come up out of there and the greatest day of my life. And it's just getting better ever since. Yeah, I've had my struggles. I've done things I'm not proud of, but God has forgiven me and I'm on my way rejoicing. And I have a lot more stories to tell you and they will increase your faith. 
Read the stories in the Bible. Get them first. And then as you go along, you'll hear stories. I have to tell one more story. I, I'm out of time, but I just want to tell you this. A friend of mine was out at the barn. We've had singing in the barn for years out there. And she was there, and she was she had taken a missionary trip down to Guatemala. And they called all the townspeople in one evening. I guess maybe I think it was a Saturday night. And everybody was supposed to bring something. They've had this big pot, a little big butcher kettle, I guess. And everybody was supposed to bring something. Bring a hunk of meat, bring some celery, bring some carrots, bring some cabbage, bring all this stuff. And we're going to put it in this pot and we're going to have a feast. So they did. They all got there. They had the pot filled up. It was cooking. It was boiling. The meat, everything was finished. It was ready to go. And they had these little bowls or whatever. And they had a big ladle. They were dipping this food out. And um, they were serving it. The pot was getting empty. There was still lots of people out there to feed. And there wasn't enough food. And they said they got down to the last little bit of porridge or whatever they called it in that pot. And right before their eyes, that pot just filled right back up to the top. This lady was telling me personally, she saw it. She saw it happen. And she said they kept on serving, rejoicing in the Lord for the Lord supplying their needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It wasn't anything they could do. It was all glory to God. Hallelujah. So they were feeding these people. They got down again to the bottom just about the bottom they had only a couple of scoops left and right before their eyes that pot filled right back up the top picture a big old butcher kettle i don't know how big their kettle was but it filled up twice until they got everybody fed the same thing happened out at our barn one night our pastor was there that night he was helping to serve food we always give everybody a meal before we'd start and the line was long everybody got a free meal and the line was long and the food was about all and they just kept serving and kept serving and kept serving. And it was just rejoicing because God will take care of you. That's just one of the little benefits of your, of your benefits package when you start serving the Lord. So receive him now as your savior and then get ready for some really good stuff to happen. Lord, thanks for this time that we could share together for these dear people who are listening and who are hearing the word of God, hearing the stories of your goodness and those stories helping us increase our faith so we can go out and reach others for you to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, and to cast out demons. Thank you for the victory that we have in you, Lord Jesus, and for your precious blood. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.